My copy of Second Place is what I'm gonna call Charmingly Coffee Stained. Sorry, book. This was my first Rachel Cusk novel. I've been meaning to read her for... a few years now? Finally did it. The reason I picked Second Place is pretty simple. All her other fiction is a trilogy and I wanted to read the standalone novel, and that's what this is. What I really like about Second Place is the fact that it's a perfect example of literary fiction. If you ever wanted to explain literary fiction to someone, and it is a weird thing to try and describe, just show them this book. Second Place is literary in every single way. It's a short 200-page novel written in gorgeous, poetic, sometimes almost surrealist language where every page could be framed as a poem, and its themes are far more important than its characters or plot. There are characters, and there is a plot, and it's all very straightforward, but all of it serves the themes that Cusk wants to explore. And that's what literary fiction is. Fiction that has very particular themes that it wants to explore, and it does so through characters and stories and plot points that represent those themes as best they can characters being vehicles for themes. But for your average reader, a novel is nothing without a plot, and the plot for this follows a woman who's all but nameless. She's just called M. The entire novel is kind of a letter from M to a guy called Jeffers. She's writing this entire thing to Jeffers. Quite often you'll forget that Jeffers is there, and you just feel like she's writing to you, and then occasionally she'll just bring up his name. And what's funny about that to me is... <laughs> This is gonna sound absolutely ludicrous. When I was in sixth form college, I hung out with a group of friends and we had this golf ball. <laughs> we found this random golf ball, we drew a face on it, and we invented a game based around the golf ball where we would throw the ball against a wall and it would bounce back and you'd have to catch it or parry it. Is that the word? That's what you say in video games. Anyway. There was a whole list of rules for this game, and the ball was called Jeffrey Winston Trundle, or Jeffers for short. And Jeffers is a name that pops up all the way through this book, and every time I just pictured a golf ball with a biro face drawn on it. <laughs> so there's my story. So she's writing to Jeffers about the fact that when she was in Paris 15 years ago, she was just walking along, and she was drawn to the window of a shop slash gallery that housed a bunch of beautiful paintings that really captivated her. So in she went and she started looking at all these gorgeous paintings that were all by the same artist, and she was truly captivated by these paintings. She felt a kind of romantic love for them, both portraits and landscapes. Now just like how M isn't named, neither is the painter. He is simply called L. She becomes a fan of his, she goes on with her life, and we learn that she lives on a marshy area of land on the English coast. During the present day period of the novel, M lives with her husband, Tony. They have a daughter who's currently at university in Germany and she periodically comes back with her German boyfriend to visit. And the two of them live a pretty isolated but comfortable and happy life out on the marsh. And one day she decides, because somehow she's met someone who knows someone who knows the painter, she has a way to contact him. And so she does. She says, hey, you know this person, I know this person, so I've managed to get hold of you. I've been a fan of your paintings for a long time. Would you like to come and stay at our house and perhaps paint the landscape? Paint what you see here. I want to know what an artist sees when they look at the place that I live. When you look out at the scenery that I see every single day, what comes to mind? What inspires you? How do you see it? How does a painter, an artist, interpret this world? She confesses she is not a painter, she does not have that eye, and so she wants to see what he creates. And after he writes her back and says that he's busy traveling here and there, he's in Los Angeles, he's in New York, he's in Rio de Janeiro, flying off, doing this, that, the other, gallery openings, blah, 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 you immediately get a sense that he's pretty egotistical and arrogant, and he really loves his life. He's wealthy, he's famous, and he adores it. He eventually says, okay, yep, I can, I can do that. I can come and stay at your place. I've got nothing going on. I'll be there soon. And so about a quarter of the way through the novel, he turns up via boat, and he's brought along a young woman called Brett, who says that she's in her early 20s, and we later learn that she's actually around 30. Brett is Elle's 
protege, arm candy, bit of both. Em and Tony didn't know that she was gonna turn up, but of course, being British, they're like, yeah, sure, of course, no problem. Come on. Now, the reason the novel, in part, is called Second Place is because Em and Tony have built a second place on their land. They have their house, and they have a kind of second home that they've managed to build or renovate. When they first moved in, they were exploring the land, and they found this dilapidated house, which they've kind of renovated and turned into their second place. And that's the guest house, and that's where the painter and his arm candy slash protege are going to live and stay while they spend time there, and they all get to know each other, and he paints things, and he actually starts doing portraits of the family, of Tony, of Em and Tony's daughter when she's back from university, visiting for the summer, and Em gets to know her hero, a man that she has admired and looked up to, whose art she loves, and that, of course, is going to cause problems. We always say, never meet your heroes. They'll let you down. This is kind of that. I guess that's one of the minor themes of the book, but it's, of course, far more complex and ambitious than that. Because what's interesting about the novel is M herself. This novel is told from her perspective. It's all in the first person. She's talking to someone called Jeffers, a person we don't know. She tells us plenty about her husband, Tony, about her daughter, about Elle, about her life experiences and where she's been. In fact, the book opens with her on a train from France to England, where she sees a man acting really strangely, and she actually calls him the devil. We get a sense of everything that she sees and how she feels about it, but not herself. We learn her personality through her actions, through her opinions about other people. We start to judge her based on the way that she judges others, interacts with other people, sees other people, spends time with people, but we still don't know much about her. And it makes you think about what a person is, what we are made up of. I've thought about this so many times. What is a personality? These days, people are so passionate about their hobbies and interests, and quite often we conflate that with a personality, and it's not the same thing. So just think about this. You meet a new person, and they want to get to know you. What do you tell them? What's the first thing you tell them? I reckon it might be your job. A lot of us talk about our job, what we do for a living, how we spend our time. Maybe we talk about where we're from or where we live. And more than likely, we'll talk about our hobbies and interests, what we like spending time doing. If you're a bookworm, a film fanatic, a gamer, your favorite genre of music, if you like to travel or not, what kinds of food you like. Typically, we talk about our likes, our dislikes, our interests, our passions, our hobbies, etc. Is any of that a personality? Is your job a personality? I think you can get a lot about a person's personality from what they choose to do for a living or have to do for a living and what hobbies and interests they choose to take up, what kinds of video games they play, what kinds of novels they read, what kinds of food they eat, what kinds of places they go to. You can learn a lot about their personality. But none of these things are adjectives that describe a person. If they're funny, if they're ambitious, if they're kind and considerate and thoughtful, if they're narcissistic, if they're complacent, if they're lazy. There are so many adjectives that we use to describe a person, and that's a personality. And what's interesting is that M doesn't have a personality, but she's also far, far from a blank slate of a character. It's just that she's always talking about other people. The place that she lives, her husband, the things she sees, the memories she has. She doesn't talk about herself, and it starts to make you wonder what a self is. I was so captivated by that, I was so captivated by her because I found her frustrating as a protagonist. Now as the novel goes on, revelations come up. Given that this is literary fiction, the revelations are not really important, they're not really the point of it. The point is to make you think about the themes and the ideas, and the emotions of the novel. So you can't really spoil it, but I'm not going to anyway. But as revelations come up and you learn new things, you do start to get a sense of M, and you see the distress in her life you start to see her unhappiness. You start to see the cracks, and you're able to peek through them at the core of her, and then you get to know her, and how she's kind of defined by her own unhappiness, and what that unhappiness looks like, where it came from, and what we're supposed to do about it. Her, and us. I found that so moving, and also welcomingly frustrating. 
I was happy to be frustrated by it. I like to be disappointed by characters. I like to hate them. I like to judge them. I like to compare myself to them or compare them to other people, people I know or people I don't. That's the beauty of literary fiction, is the way that it makes you think and feel about the world around you. It makes the novel feel like a part of your world rather than any kind of escape from it. Literary fiction is not genre fiction, it is not escapism, it is not fantasy. It is something that makes you reflect on yourself, makes you reflect on the world around you. In that sense, this novel feels like a blend of the works of Kazuo Ishiguro and Virginia Woolf. Those were the two authors I kept thinking of while I read this. Second place feels thematically like the works of Kazuo Ishiguro. The themes are what's important. And Ishiguro is my favourite author of all time, so I'm happy about that. And then aesthetically, the poetic beauty of the language felt very Virginia Woolf. The fact that it's also kind of surreal at times. To the point that occasionally you're like, wait, what's going on here? That's very Virginia Woolf. So much metaphor. So much beauty in the language. So much poetry. So, if you take the works of Kazuo Ishiguro thematically, and the aesthetic beauty of the works of Virginia Woolf and smush them together, you get this. A book that really frustrated me in the best way possible. I welcome that frustration. There's so much more I could say. Again, that's the beauty of literary fiction, and this is kind of the peak of the genre, or at least certainly something I'm going to use and hold up as a perfect example of the power of literary fiction on its reader. So check it out. It's real good. Can't wait to read more Rachel Cusk and subscribe for books.